So that's what we're going to do now is uh, learn how to ferment vegetables. So what we have here are, you know, just, just so I can keep talking and you all don't have to, you know, sort of watch me chopping or, or, or shredding vegetables, is we've done a little bit of pre-prepping and um, chopped up some cabbage, grated some turnip and some carrot, and chopped up some chili peppers. Um, you know, I, I mean, these are fairly classic vegetables to incorporate. You could ferment any vegetable. Like there's no vegetable that you could not incorporate into uh, 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 something like this. And um, you know, I would I, I would really encourage you know anybody to feel free to be experimental. Uh, try different vegetables. I mean. I can't promise you that every vegetable is going to be as delicious as every other vegetable when you ferment it. So, you know, definitely don't, um, you know, do your experiments in 200 liter batches. But, um, you know, if, um, um, you know, do, do small batches and, you know, see what you think of kale kraut. I mean, pr I, I raise that as an example because personally I love kale as, you know, one of many ingredients. But when I've done kale alone, it just any dark green vegetable that's rich in chlorophyll will ferment with a stronger flavor that you might like or you might not like. So, you know, it, like experiment in small batches, but don't be afraid of experimenting. I mean, you know, um, uh, kale kraut is not going to hurt anyone even if, you know, you think the flavor is a little bit too strong for you. Um, so, so we've shredded the vegetables. It doesn't much matter whether you shred them finely or coarsely. Like our objective ultimately is to get the vegetables submerged. We'll get the most concentrated flavor if we can get them submerged under their own juices. So, so, so really our first objective is to get the juice out of the vegetables. Um, it's also possible to ferment whole vegetables. I mean, there's a couple of examples right here of fermented whole vegetables. You know, that's a little bit more complicated but you, because you have to mix a salt water solution, a brine, to pour over the vegetables, um, you know, which has the potential to dilute the flavor a little bit. So usually other kinds of seasonings are, are added in when you, um, you know, put a, a brine over vegetables uh, uh, to uh, compensate for the dilution of, of the flavors. But you get the most concentrated flavor in the sour sauerkraut method, also known as the dry salting method, um, because you're getting the vegetables submerged under their own juices. So what I did before we started um, um, is I, I took the bowl of shredded vegetables and just lightly sprinkled salt and mixed it throughout them. And um, you know I can see it, but it's possible that you can't. But you know all the places where there were grains of salt are wet because through the physical process of osmosis, the, the, the salt pulls juice, pulls water out of the vegetables. Um, so, um, you know, that begins the process of getting the, the, the juice out of the vegetables. And then, um, you know, what will continue the process is um, getting in there with your hands and squeezing the vegetables or alternatively pounding them. Like, you know, I, I, for me, on a small scale like this, I like to just use my hands and it really just takes a few minutes of, of, of squeezing to get the vegetables nice and juicy. Um, you know, I mean, when, when, when villages were getting together and making barrels of, uh, of, of kraut sur for survival through a long winter in, uh, you know, Eastern Europe somewhere, I mean, they probably weren't, um, squeezing them with their hands like this, they'd have some sort of a, a big blunt tamping device, you know, let's say a much larger version of something like this, and they'd be just smashing, you know, smashing down with, with the blunt heavy device. Or um, a story that I've heard over and over again, usually from people older than me who grew up in Eastern Europe, is they take small children, scrub their feet, put them inside the barrel, and let the kids jump up and down on the vegetables as their, you know, parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents are shredding vegetables. Um, but you know, whether whether you can jump up and down on them or use some you know, blunt, heavy tool or just get in there with your hands, you're really doing exactly the same thing. You're bruising the vegetables, you're breaking down cell walls, and you're releasing water. And maybe you all can see that this is just getting juicier as I'm doing this. And now that you can also see that the volume has um, uh, uh, reduced, so now there's room for me to add in, add in the carrots, add in the turnips. I'm going to wait to add in the chili peppers because I'd rather not do this sort of squeezing with my hands with the chili peppers. I'll wait till everything else is juicy and then I'll mix in the 
mix in the chili peppers so I can sort of minimize the contact of my hands with the chili peppers. Let me talk a little bit about the salt. Um, like you're probably, well, I haven't, I haven't added salt in front of you all. I added the salt before, but I just lightly sprinkled it. And I, with the expectation that I'll have to add more salt. It is always easier to add salt than it is to subtract salt. Um, you know, if you should, you know, if you should discover that you oversalted your your batch of vegetables, it's not, it's not impossible to remove salt. I mean, the best thing would be to, you know, chop up more vegetables to dilute the the the, the oversaltiness. Um, but if you've already chopped all your vegetables, if you already have just enough to fill the vessel that you're using. Um, you know, what I would say is just, just pour water, not chlorinated water right out of the tap, but, you know, some form of dechlorinated water, filtered water, water where the chlorine was allowed to evaporate, spring water, um, over the vegetables. Let it sit for a few minutes and pour the excess water off and it'll take salt with it. And then, and then you'd want to just uh, 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 taste it. Um, you know, it doesn't matter too much what kind of salt you use. I'd say in general, try to avoid iodized table salt, um, just because the iodine itself could potentially inhibit fermentation. Um, I like to use, you know, unrefined sea salt, but, but don't get too caught up in it or feel like, you know, you can't do it until you find the right kind of salt. The lactic acid bacteria are very salt tolerant and they're not very picky about what kind of salt. Um, in terms of the amount of salt, I mean, there's no magic number. I mean, salted to taste, if we had, you know, four different batches and had everybody, you know, taste batches at different salinities, you know, th th there's never a consensus. Like some people like it saltier, some people like it less salty. You know, part of the magic of making things for yourself is you can figure out how you like them and, you know, make it as salty as you like. There's no magic number. Don't, don't be a slave to a recipe somewhere. Um, you know, just, just mix everything together together, get it nice and juicy, taste a little bit. It's pretty good. I'm going to add just a tiny, tiny bit more salt. Yeah. And then I'll just mix that up a little bit more. You can also add other seasonings. Um, I love caraway seeds. I use them sometimes. Juniper berries are a classic sauerkraut uh, 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 seasoning. Uh, in Russia, often they'll do it with cranberries or apples. Um, and you can also be experimental. I've had some wonderful curry krauts that people have made. Um, you know, you can really season this however you like, and you know, don't be afraid to. Um, um, you know, try, try something new. Now I'm going to go ahead and mix these chili peppers in. And then let's just talk a little bit about vessels. So, I mean, the most straightforward vessel, uh, you know, for, you know, small household fermentation would simply be um, mason jars. So we're, we're going to use th this jar as, as a vessel. Other possible vessels include ceramic crocks. There's all kinds of, um, uh, you know, different uh, 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 shapes that, that people around the world use. The sort of classic American style is a cylindrical shape, and you know these are these are mass produced and, and widely available. Most Asian cultures work with more like pot belly uh, uh, shapes. But you know, different kinds of ceramic crocks can work wonderfully. Um, uh, uh, glass, wood, barrels. I mean, if you can find small, you know, three or five liter countertop barrels, those are those are really great. Um, you know, functionally plastic works great. Food, food grade plastic buckets. Um, the material that it's really important to avoid is metal, because salt can corrode metal. And then the acids that will be developing during the fermentation can corrode metal. And although the uh, theoretically stainless steel is, is non-corrosive, it turns out that household stainless steel just has a thin coating that's stainless. And anytime, anywhere where it gets scratched, it can, it can start to corrode. So you know, unless you have access to very heavy-duty industrial stainless steel, just stay away from, uh, from stainless steel vessels and work with you know, glass, ceramic, uh, wood, or, or even plastic. Okay, so I've got nice juicy vegetables. My, my test for, for when they're juicy enough is I like to just pick up a handful of them and squeeze it. And I want to see like a sponge. 
um, uh, with, with liquid coming out. And then I know that when I, when I stuff it into the vessel and press down, there's going to be juice that can be liberated and will um, um, cover the vegetables and keep them submerged.